in Hebrews chapter 4 and beginning with verse 1, where Paul says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise be left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. We were almost there, but we came short of it. Now Paul here, if you read the first few chapters of Hebrews, he's talking about the Israelites that come out of Egypt, and he's trying to reference the likeness of Moses with Christ, and how Moses was, it was a future representation of Christ, and how he led his people out of Egypt. And so there was a point in time where that, and it's important to understand that when they came out of Egypt, they came out extremely wealthy because they plundered the Egyptians. So they, they gathered all the gold and silver and gems and all those type of, of jewelry, wealthy things, as much as they could carry with themselves. Now out of Egypt into the promised land, they had cattle, they had sheep, they had oxen, they had cattle, they had everything. They plundered the Egyptians. So they come out of over 400 years of slavery, having virtually nothing. Now all of a sudden they're incredibly wealthy of the wealth of Egypt. It lasted them about two and a half months. They ran out of food. They ran out of these things. And now you, you can't eat gold and you can't eat silver and you can't eat fine linen and those type of things. They ran out of food and now they're left desolate, so to speak. And God promised them that he was going to provide for them, but they turned their evil hearts against God, began to murmur against Moses, against Aaron, and against God. And they declared, would it have been that we would have been left in Egypt, at least in Egypt. We knew where we were. We knew what we were doing. We knew we had plenty of food. We might have been slaves and in bondage, but it beats a whole lot better than where we're at right now, which is in nowhere. And they missed the promise. They missed entering to. Now I want to explain to us and give us definition here this morning to help clarify even for our lives today. Once again, that, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering to into His. Into His. Now see folks, God always wants it His way. Amen. He wanted them to enter into His. Into His. Not into theirs, not into mine, not into yours, but God wants us to enter into His. Whenever we set ourselves before God, that becomes an incredible conflict. And that's what the people were experiencing. They didn't want to. They hadn't learned yet how to trust in God. They hadn't learned yet how to have character and nature about them. And so they were so close to the promise of entering into His, that's God's way, God's ideas, God's thoughts. A few weeks ago I preached on how that God's thoughts are different than our thoughts and God's ways are higher than our ways. Therefore, I encourage all of us on a daily basis to ask God to bless your life abundantly. And I declared to us a few weeks ago, stop trying to live life your way and let us begin really living life God's way. Let, let us stop trying so hard on our own and let us surrender our things unto God. And let's think His thoughts and let's work His ways. Let's do His things. And when we do that, we enter into His rest. Now let me explain what rest means. Please listen closely. God's rest was not just about not working on the seventh day or the declared Sabbath day. Yes, that was part of the law. But it wasn't just now you work for six days and now you stop working for the seventh day and you just rest and you get back all of your energy. No, it wasn't that hardly at all. That was just a very, very minute part of it. But what God means when he says enter into his rest is this. That we have full assurance that after a six day work period, so to speak, as a metaphor, we work and we do all that we're supposed to and we obey God and we fulfill the laws of God. We fulfill the ways of God. Our thoughts are God's thoughts. And on that last day, so to speak, we enter into rest. In other words, we look back now and with a sense of real gratitude, 
with a sense of satisfaction, with a sense of accomplishment, with a sense of being settled, with a sense of being right. You know, you're, I'm, I'm right where I'm supposed to be, I'm doing the right things, I'm about the right things, and all is well. You see, that's entering into the rest of God. That you look at your life for this moment, for this time, and you say to yourself, all is well. All is well, and I'm gratified in that. I'm satisfied in that. I linger in that. And I receive that from God. And you see, folks, it means it does away with the stress. It does away with the worry. It does away with the discouragement. It does away with the frustration. It does away with the disappointment. It does away with the depression. It does away with the complaining. It does away with the grumbling. It does away with all of those negative things that can infiltrate our lives as human beings and not give us rest. See, they couldn't enter into with a satisfaction that all is well in their lives with God because they always thought there needed to be more. They couldn't trust God that He was going to provide them food for that seventh day. That He was going to give them physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual rest on that seventh day. They felt like they had to go out and do it on their own. They had to live it their way and not trust in the Word of God. Not trust in the promise of God. Therefore, in their grumbling, became disbelief. And that it was the sin, the great sin of unbelief. You see, folks, now listen closely to what I'm going to say. I feared it so often, and I speak from years of experience, that people become disappointed with God. Things aren't as I want them to be. Things aren't as I think they should be. Seems like maybe I'm either failing or God is failing me. I'm not sure that the Bible works anymore. I'm not sure of the Word of God. Maybe I'm not sure that God really cares about me anymore. I'm not sure that God hears. Maybe I need to pray a different way. Maybe if I gave more money to some other ministry, maybe that would fix my disappointment. And we become so disappointed with God. And, and day after day, and week after week, and month after month, year after year, and before you know it, people just kind of settle into this delusionment. Oh, they're probably still Christians, and, and they probably still believe, but all the joy, all the satisfaction, all the gratification, all the sense of being right and well, all of that's gone. It's gone. And you see, that's not entering into the rest, into His Rest. Hallelujah. Who are we to put ourselves above God? Who are we to declare that we know better how it should be done than God? I fear, and again I speak from experience. You know, God, I'm all stressed out and you should be stressed out too. And if you're stressed out, then why aren't you answering my prayer so I don't have to be stressed out? And the whole time, God is just waiting for us to trust Him and enter into His rest. Yes. Not my rest, but His rest. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And that's what that means. That's the promise. And at the end of verse 1, Paul said that any of us, that we should even today, should come <coughs> short of that rest. Now let's look at verse 2. And then Paul says, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So there was no profit of the word that was preached. Now here, in profit, I'm not talking about material things. I'm not talking about earthly things. This word is not talking about earthly things, other than what it means to sustain each other, that it means to sustain you. The scripture said, David said, I have never seen the righteous gone hungry. I've never seen the righteous gone hungry. God will not abandon his people, say amen. God will not abandon his church. We are his church. I belong to him. You belong to him. We belong to God. God, this church belongs to God, say amen. You see, the righteous have never gone hungry. And so when Paul says the word did not profit them, in other words, folks, 
There's things about this word and the nature and the character of God that can only be known and understood and obeyed and sensed through a revelation of the Spirit. And when we live in the Spirit, the Word of God comes to us. There's profit in this. Sometimes for some people it's financial profit. Sometimes for some people it's physical, health profit. For others it's business profit. For others it's career or maybe popularity profit. Profit in many different ways. But the one profit that God wants most of all is the profit of the knowledge of knowing Him. And the profit of entering into His rest. That is so profitable. I talked with my wife we were sharing the other day. Turn the TV off. I just said, you know, we're not going to watch TV for a while. We're just going to sit on the couch and hold hands and just talk. And so we did for a while. It was weird. It was weird. It was like, okay, this is weird. <laughs> okay, wow, you know, I'm not 16 anymore. I'm, you know, shouldn't we like turn on the TV and, you know, like have some other noise in the house? And we just sat there and talked. You know, one of the things that I, I wanted to just share my wife with I it, it just about the, the wellness of God and, and, and how invaluable the experiences that we've, we've gone through all of our lives and, and where we're at in our home and our family and our children and just life in general. And just so thankful, just so thankful for the blessings of God and just reminiscing the, the precious value. We sang it this morning. How great is our God? And you know, sometimes I think husbands and wives and family and, and moms and dads with their children, often on a regular basis, you need to talk about how great God is. Yes. How great God is. How great the church is. How great God is and all of His promises and His Spirit and the fellowship of the body, the, the fellowship of the Spirit, and especially the fellowship of the Word. Yes. Hallelujah. And you see, Paul says when that Word was preached to them, it did not profit them. How sad is that? How sad is that? A person would go to church almost their whole lives and experience no profit of the Word of God. Experience very little to no profit of the Kingdom of God. And there's a reason for that. And I'm going to get to it in just a moment. But it didn't profit them. Why? Because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. You see, listen to this now, folks. If the Word of God is preached and it comes to our ears and it enters our hearts, if there's something else in our hearts that's not receptive for the Word of God, there's no mixing and there's no profit of that Word. Amen. So if the Word of God is to come to us and encourage us, and if I'm so angry and I'm so bitter in my heart against a circumstance, a person, or maybe even God, that word of encouragement cannot mix in my heart and profit me to encourage me because that's what dwells in my heart is not compatible with the word that was just preached. Unless through worship or unless through another experience, I open my heart up and say, God, I receive I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to think like this. I don't want to be like that. Amen. Oh God, come in. You see, Christian people, God coming in isn't just a one-time experience. We need to pray God coming in every day. And that's just not a metaphor. And that's just, I mean, that's serious. Every single day, God needs to come in. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. And so if God, the word of the Lord, comes and enters our heart and there's faith there, there's hope there, there's joy there, there's hunger, there's a longing there, then that word will mix with what's in the heart and the result of that mixing is a prophet and entering into his rest. It doesn't get any better than that. Entering into the rest of God. Can you say amen? Now, let's jump down and let's look at verse 11. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. So Paul says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Let us labor. There's work that needs to be done. This is not something that just happens automatic. It just doesn't, it just doesn't appear out of the sky from nowhere. 
There's labor that needs to be done. There's work that needs to be done. I need to do a self-analysis of my person. The Jews needed to do a self-analysis of their hope, of their faith. And so Paul says, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You see, it's sad that Christian people can be believers but at the same time, in many circumstances, they are full of unbelief. 